Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to everybody who lives this new life in Jesus Christ. All I have is Christ. In, in a different way, we sing it another way. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And whether it's a song, whether it's a piece of special music, whether it's a personal piece of scripture, it defines us who we are as the body of Christ. And it's a privilege to be a part of the Church of God's Seventh Day because we recognise we have work to do. We are called as children of God, as disciples. And today I want to explore the subject of discipleship. We talked a little bit last week about evangelism. The two areas of preaching and teaching. The first point of contact being evangelism. And all of us evangelists with our different gifts. But then we move on to discipleship. I was talking to a man in Africa who's really keen on evangelism. And he wants hundreds of people to come to his campaigns. And I said, this is really, really wonderful. But how are we going to disciple them? Where are the pastoral teachers and equippers to be able to spend the three, four years taking them from the milk of the word to the fullness of Christ? And this subject of discipleship is very, very powerful and very, very encouraging. Um, we are, as we understand it, one body with one Lord, one faith, one hope, one salvation, and one Jesus Christ. And that oneness is reflected between Jesus Christ and the Father. The Father and I, said Jesus, are one. And that idea of oneness is manifest in the marriage relationship between a man and a woman, monogamous for life to the exclusion of all others. And the Lord uses the term one. They shall become one flesh. We understand that oneness. And the joint relationship of the oneness of the Father and the Son extend to us. And the first scripture, as I explore that, is where John, Jesus teaches, in John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So Jesus acknowledges that he's been sent from the Father, but no one can come to Jesus unless the Father is part of that calling, drawing equation. And then the authority by what happens as a result of that process projects to the last day, where Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. Then in a few verses on, in chapter, verse 65 of John chapter 6, Jesus again reiterates this same thought. He says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So the oneness of the Father and the Father and Son, there's a dynamic in their relationship. And that relationship extends to us, in us coming to Jesus. But it's got to be granted and called by the sovereignty of the Father. Now the inverse dynamic is also true in John chapter 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that's very powerful and we recognise that our salvation is through Jesus our high priest who intercedes on our behalf. So the Father draws us to Jesus but then Jesus also shows how that equation works that no one can come to the Father except through Jesus and the reality of the oneness and then Jesus takes this relationship of being drawn by the Father and called to Christ in John chapter 14, verse 12, a few verses on. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to my Father. Now, for the last 2,000 years, theologians and laymen alike have looked at this and gone, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. What were the works of Jesus Christ? They were according to the will of the Father and... And then he says, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Well, can there be any greater works than Jesus Christ? But because the Holy Spirit has been sent to us, by the power of faith in the authority of Jesus' name, we see that in Peter and John, a layman outside the temple waiting for arms and gifts. And Peter and John say, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And we see 
a great miracle in the name of Jesus uh, long after Jesus Christ had ascended to heaven. And you and I are recipients of this grace. And we are called to have faith. We cannot come before God and ask and pray in the name of Jesus without this kind of faith. What draws us together, what helps us believe, what transforms us, is you are saved by grace through faith and not of works, as Paul said, lest any man should boast. So you are blessed. You and I were called from certain death and darkness. You know, Jesus says, apart from me you can do nothing unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. He says, you've got no life in you. And see, we know what it's like for many of us to grow up without God or to live a part of our life without the righteous, holy law of God and the lawgiver that presides above the law. Well, you and I were redeemed from death. We don't look... We don't anticipate death as the ultimate solution. Or when I was in Myanmar, nirvana, nothingness, to divest ourselves of all everything, to become nothing. It's one of the anomalies of that religion. We've been brought into eternal fellowship to walk in the light, to live in the light, and to work in the light, and to reflect the light into a world that desperately needs it. We are called to be partakers of a divine nature. If you knew me 30, 40, 50 years ago, you would see a lot of human nature there. Now, by God's grace, by his Holy Spirit, we're all being transformed as children of God. And the old person is lessening and the righteousness of Christ is being established. And from that, we now live a life of gratitude. Our greatest prayer is, God, thank you. Father, thank you for every gift, every grace, every moment of opportunity that allows us to live this new life in Christ. All I have is Christ, says the lyricist, who understands something very, very powerful. And so we have joy. This power of redemption. You know, there's a song, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. Think, wow, I once was, was, was the son of darkness deceived in the world, and now I'm a son of light. The greatest price of the universe was paid in Jesus' blood. And that compels me to sing another song. I surrender all. There's no other thing. When I was being counselled for baptism, somebody said to me, well, John, you know, um, um, asking me, you know, what options do you have? Well, I said, I don't have any other options. I see God and the Son of Jesus Christ. Where do I go from here? There is nowhere. Because I've, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And as a result, the work of the Holy Spirit we become ministers of that light, reflecting the greater light. And we have a calling to the gospel of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope that spurs us on. And that fellowship that we've been called to calls us into a deeper relationship and a deeper covenant and a great commission that God has called us to. The Apostle Paul said something. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we are called to imitate Jesus Christ. And I love it when I hear testimonies of brothers and sisters in faith who've been in testing, challenging circumstances and it wasn't old, ugly human nature raising their head. There was the willingness to suffer, the willingness not to talk back, to allow Christ in you to have that sovereignty because you are anchored in Christ. And that's powerful and that's totally transformative. Now in first century, if we talk about a disciple, a disciple was a student who a rabbi would choose and follow. And sometimes a disciple in rabbinical times would take a boy seven or eight years of age. Remember Samuel went to serve in the, in the tabernacle after he was weaned? He was just a little boy and he went to work with Eli and he became one of the prophets of Israel. And, um, and so you would see examples of a rabbi mentoring a younger man as a disciple. And if a rabbi walked with a limp you would probably find the the disciple walking with a limp behind. And if the rabbi ate three biscuits, the disciple would eat three biscuits because there was so much on following the rabbi and living the life. He slept on a solid board, the boy would sleep on a solid board. It's very hard for us to understand and understand that today. But when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, Paul had grown up as a disciple of Gamaliel, drawn into the Pharisaical order. It was only on the road to Damascus that all that deck of cards came crumbling down. So Paul no longer imitated Gamaliel, he imitated Christ. And that's a, very, that's a powerful shift. 
John, the beloved disciple, penned this particular mimicking this way to all who did receive him and believed in his name, Jesus Christ gave the right to become children of God. If I look at my six children, I can see similarities of the genetic imprint that's come from Rebecca and myself. And, and what we're talking about is the divine imprint that allows us to be children of God, not born of blood of flesh or the will of man, as Scripture says. So as a parent or a grandparent, there's nothing nicer when your children communicate with you. And that plays out on the divine level. And the instrument that we have is prayer. It's to go before God constantly and all the time, in every figure, in every way, with thanksgiving, prayer, request, intercession, all the time. Our greatest calling in the life is one of prayer. And, and it's communion. It's communion in the form of God. And I encourage you, never leave the moment of prayer until you experience in your spirit a stronger affirmation. Because sometimes we try to, to, take, um, to take prayer like a lunch bar on the run, just a little muesli bar, and then that'll keep me going for the day. You know, being a disciple of Jesus Christ involves breaking bread. So prayer is one level. Another one is sharedness, sharing a meal and sharing of your life. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means, number one, of course, having repented of your sins and foilings and fables and aligning your thoughts and your actions under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul taught those at Colossae, and I've mentioned this many times. It's almost a catch Christ scripture. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. So on. And I can say, is that the benchmark by which we as children of God as disciples, Jesus said everything that he spoke came from the Father, everything that he did came from the Father because of the oneness that Jesus Christ shares with the Father. You and I are called to share a covenant with Jesus Christ. So put yourself against that mirror of spiritual Jesus Christ and is everything that you say and I say in the name of Jesus Christ because what you'll experience as a disciple of Jesus Christ is that your old friends or people in the workplace will wonder especially when you're first called to the faith, why they don't, why, you wonder why they don't see the exhilarating joy in Christ that you see. Try it. On Monday morning when you go to work or wherever you are, you greet your friend at work. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Try it. Are you brave enough? Don't look a fool. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. But you'll see a certain disconnect. That's what I'm referring to. They don't see the light of God as you do, the joy of the Spirit. You are total, but you are the light in, the, in that environment. And sometimes you will experience rebuff from people who don't know, either in their words, but sometimes in the action. The latest Bible advocate has a very beautiful article, if you can get to read it, by Sherry Langdon. She officiated with a few words at her grandfather's funeral. And she talks about how she tried and her mother tried to introduce her grandfather to Christ and how stubbornly against Christ he was. She gives an example. I won't give, it too, give too much away. But they were talking about faith and so she switches off the television to talk to grandfather about Jesus Christ. He gets the remote and turns the television back on again to cut off the conversation. And that happens progressively until he dies. And she struggles with that. And read the article... And then you value the calling that we've been given and, and how that sometimes the rebuff that happens within family hurts because there's so much you want them to know Jesus Christ and to be transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But you and I, because of the joy that we have in Christ, are already evangelists. But the life of discipleship is the nurture and the commitment to allow the grace of life in Christ to minister in the lives of others. And within the church community is the number one place where we gather for fellowship, where we gather to hear the word of God, where we gather to be equipped with a bigger vision that transcends our own cares in this daily life and allow <coughs> the work of the Holy Spirit to stir us up to action, to stir us up above the, the call of mediocrity. 
And so we have a desire to read Scripture every day. Why? So that we can give a reason of the hope that's in us. You might know that you're going to be resurrected on the last day, but how do you put your arm around somebody crying, grieving the loss of a loved one and explain to them in the authority of the name of Jesus about the resurrection? We need to be familiar with the word of God because scripture says we are no longer our own. Um, We were bought with a price. We were bought by the blood of Jesus and that transforms us and, and challenges us. You know, Paul says you are not your own. Not your own agenda, not your own words, not your own life. You were bought with a price. And every year at the Lord's Supper, the Christian Passover, we celebrate and commemorate the price that was paid for us. The Son of God with the Father, divested himself of his glory, entered our world as, as Jesus, the baby born to, to Mary, and only he, as the Lamb of God, could pay for our sins. And he did that. Teach that to our children and our grandchildren. And so, because we understand that we've been saved by grace through faith, it's a call to energy and strength in the Lord, not stagnation. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means growth. You'll spend the rest of your life growing. Just like you see your children growing, you are growing spiritually. And the maturity becomes evident among your family and brothers and sisters in Christ. It also means moving forward. Where you are today, in five or ten years' time, you'll be in a different place because Jesus Christ is Lord and mentoring and moulding and shaping you. Part of this is being stretched, what I call being stretched, and being tested. God never tempts us, but he does allow us to be tested and he does allow us to be stretched. As we become more disciples of Jesus, we begin to see the world and see each other as Jesus sees us. So we truly become the eyes of Jesus. When Jesus saw the great crowd of people, it says he had compassion on them. So do we have compassion? Is our first response in the brokenness of this world Compassion. Well, it certainly was when I heard from Case last night and three little children in a terrible domestic situation. And then to understand why Jesus Christ wants us to embrace this vision. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send labourers into his field. Jesus says, here we are, there's a scripture. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the labourers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, Now there's a call to prayer. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. You know, Apostle Paul and Apollos his helper, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. Both growth in numbers, in maturity, as well as in the growth in leadership. The harvest is plenteous. I see 24, 25 million people here in Australia hungry for the word of God. And I look forward as time grows, to see the power and the work of God's Spirit and our prayers to be answered. Now, we also have the disciples coming to Jesus in their inadequacy and saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus goes through the Lord's prayers, a basic structure, our Father in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. And so we say, your will done on earth as it's done in heaven? And we look forward to the fullness of that and we have a responsibility. So we are to pray for all those God has given us, our spouses, our children, our families, the work colleagues we work in and in the community, to pray for them, to be as intercessors before the Father. I also encourage you, don't forget to pray for yourself. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his immediate disciples and he prays for those who believe on account of their ministry, their testimony. And pray for those who God may call through your witness, through something you say, something you do. And intercede, as we spoke last week about evangelism, pray for them by name. It's very powerful. If all that you have at your disposal is to go before God in prayer, then you have done what Jesus Christ has commanded you. Now, The interesting thing, by Jesus instructing his disciples to earnestly pray, and when you pray for earnestly, somehow you take stewardship of it because you see what the Lord sees. And you know most of those disciples, 
He came the labourers in the field. Peter, James, Jude, Matthew. Thomas, we understand, went to India from secular history. And because we, what we do by praying, we embrace the vision that Jesus has for us. Let me say, what, say that again. By praying, we embrace the vision that Jesus has for us and the church collectively. And that's very powerful. So I simply ask, as we pray today, ask God to provide labourers in the field here in Australia from, what, from his resources, from his insight and understanding to have that personal conviction, to see that sense of personal stewardship, the same thing that Jesus asked his disciples to pray for. And we can encounter that in the book of Isaiah. The Lord says, who will go? Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. That's one of my favourite hymns of my dad. You know, um, and I can't remember the name of the particular hymn, but it's, it's based on Isaiah. God says, who'll go? Who'll send? It's almost as if he's waiting for us to sort of say, I'll put my hand up. And so, are we quick to answer? Yes, God, I'll go. I see a need. Am I quick to pray about it? What about the examples where Jesus asked people to follow him and they said, but first let me do something else? And the reality is, no, there's no but. Father and mother, brother and sister, as close as we are to love them, Jesus is to be first. His calling is to be first. His work is to be first. Um, have you ever said in prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I forsake all to accept your will for my life in every way? That's a bit scary because you're surrendering all at that moment. And if you pray about that earnestly, then you make yourself available. Being available is one of the greatest things that we can have. I mentioned it last week. Hannah introduced me to a series of sermons, The Fat Christian. Faithful, available and teachable. And available is very powerful. And Isaiah made himself available. Um, Matthew 6.33, Jesus teaches, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Make yourself available of his kingdom. And who's the king? Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Make yourself available for that. And all your physical needs that you ever need will be provided. I came back, I'll give you an example of answered prayer. Every time I've gone overseas, because I'm not earning a great deal of money, I come back broke. But every time I've travelled overseas, before I've gone, I've said, God, please, may I not come back financially broke and struggle to... And every time, this time I came back from overseas and the tax check came through and I was glad for that and the money that I had in the bank was not gobbled up through miscellaneous expenses. And then I thought, hey, John, you have a responsibility to give God thanks. He heard your prayer. And five weeks later, you come back from overseas and you go, God, you heard my prayer again. I think this is the third year that I've been praying that specifically because I know what it's like to be self-employed and come back with absolutely nothing. It's very hard. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. This is a personal testimony. I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I'm just saying, God, thank you that I had even the temerity to even pray it. Because sometimes we don't think about it till later in hindsight. See, if we don't pray, if we don't regularly come before the throne of grace, we become a static Christian, a lukewarm Christian. And I don't want a lukewarm wife in our relationship. I don't want a lukewarm relationship with any of us. I want us to love one another and be connected. And a lukewarm Christian is neither compelled nor repulsed. And somebody mentioned in a conversation this week from the book of Revelation, Jesus really deals with this lukewarmness. He said, I'm just having nothing to do with you. And that's the reality. Lukewarm people are satisfied with mediocrity. They're satisfied with something else other than Jesus Christ. And our greatest satisfaction should be in Jesus Christ. Rebecca and I were reading scripture where Jesus Christ was the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation is not a very common word. It means God the Father was satisfied, propitiated, satisfied in the price paid that all the world's sins were paid for on the blood of Jesus. Now, that divine satisfaction in the, in the righteousness of God that condemns us to death in the blood of Jesus is very, very powerful 
And you and I must find our satisfaction in the person of Jesus Christ, in his word, in his life, and be responsive as a result. All I have is Christ, are the lyrics of the song that we heard earlier. And these are not just glib, soft, fuzzy-wuzzy words that make us feel good. This is the rock on which we stand. This is the testimony that we have, the life that we have. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And he understood that. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are then compelled by love that nurtures us and moves us forward. And so by the fruits of evangelism, when we call to the faith, we see our own inadequacy. We see our sin. We see our brokenness. And we're, through repentance, we're brought then into a life of discipleship to become an image bearer of Jesus Christ, just like Jesus Christ was an image bearer of the Father. And so as a disciple of Jesus Christ, there was a Christian author who used the term a holy discontent. You're not satisfied with the status quo anymore. And you look for ways to, you see as everybody, as a potential son of God. Have you ever been in a big city, uh, Perth City, lunch hour rush time, when people are crossing the big intersections? And you might see you know, 150 people crossing an intersection in different ways. And you look at them and you think, how many of these people know God? I go to Los Angeles airport and I see 3,000 people waiting to go through a security screening. And I'm thinking, how many of these people know God? I have a discontent in my heart because I know that one day scripture says every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But I don't see that today. But the promise is there. And the discontent in my heart with the brokenness and suffering. To see a mother on a stronger drug addiction no longer can look after her children breaks our heart. But that's the fruit of blindness of a society gone far from God. See, true discipleship is vibrant. We talk about a vibrant 21st century church. A true disciple is alive, proactive, available. And a true disciple embodies what I call the multiplying factor. A true disciple makes other disciples. Very interesting. They make other disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do this one person at a time. You know, Jesus spent three and a half years mentoring his 12 disciples. He took them from young men on the milk of the word and on the day of Pentecost you see the transformation because of the Holy Spirit. It took about three and a half years. We see the mentoring and equipping of discipleship. Joshua was a young man who stayed at the gate of the tabernacle and over many years the leadership as Moses grew an older man this young Joshua was being equipped by the Holy Spirit to serve in leadership, an older man with a younger man. Elijah mentored and equipped Elisha. In fact, when Elijah was departing, Elisha made a request. He said, can I have a request? Can I have a double portion of the Holy Spirit from what you've had? And Elijah said, well, this is a hard question. What would you ask? It's a good question. Why did Elijah, Elisha ask that? He was a disciple. He was being mentored. In the New Testament, you see Paul investing his life in Christ in a shy young pastor named Timothy who had tummy pain or whatever he had. And Paul instructs him into courage, into ministry, to do the work of evangelist. You and I are here today because somebody at some stage invested their life in Christ and invested in you as a mentor. Circumstances brought you this far. It might have been your parents. It might have been your grandparents. It might have been somebody who introduced you to Jesus Christ. Somebody who prayed for you. We are here as a result of that grace. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers of few become the framework that places the burden on our heart of, of, of a healthy discontent with the status quo. And I know that you and I are not here just to warm a seat. We want to be equipped. We want to be strengthened in the Lord's work. And we feel okay with that. Why? Because Jesus Christ's life was invested in us. And not by, might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, with Christ in us. John says to those he writes, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus says, you'll do greater works than these. And so we're not called to mediocrity. We're called to reflect Jesus Christ, to be teachers of the word, to be witnesses as God calls to those he brings us in, into counsel with. And we are guided by the Holy Spirit in this. 
So when we sing, and we're going to conclude today on a hymn, I Surrender All. It's a powerful affirmation on a congregational level, saying, look, I'm letting go of stuff that I've held on to the past. God, how do you want me to be in your service? How do you want me to live a life of a disciple? A real disciple, mirroring and reflecting Jesus Christ in this world. Because a calling to discipleship in Christ is the greatest, most noble responsibility that we have in this life. And we're all disciples, male or, male or female, young or old. It's to fully embrace the vision that Jesus Christ has for us, to understand it and to see the world as Jesus sees it. The great crowd of people who followed Jesus for three days, he looked them on them compassionately. He looked on the crowds of people as sheep without a shepherd, sheep that were subject to wolves, looking for something because we are created in the image and likeness of God and Jesus had compassion on them. And may our hearts be compassionate and may our hearts be strengthened with energies to invest in the lives of others in everything we say and everything we do. The takeaway for this is the challenge, well, think, great. You know, I'm happy to follow Christ. I'm happy to live by the commandments of God. But how do I understand this call to discipleship? It's a little bit of a grey area. I can't do this. I don't know. I'm just like, I'm a good Christian. I do the right thing. I love my husband. I love my kids. How am I, what, what is this discipleship and what's the takeaway for me? Well, the reality is faith. Jesus called young men on the shore of Galilee. They were been 18 to 22 in the age. He said something, two things. He said, follow me, number one. They left everything and followed him. And then he said, I will make you fishes of men or whatever it is. So there's two things in that. The faith to leave that, all that you've had in the past to follow Christ and let Jesus make you. Because we can't do it on ourselves. And that's the caveat when you surrender all to Christ. He moulds and shapes. Otherwise we can't do it. We don't have the will to do it. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to embrace this kingdom vision. See, Jesus says, I will make you. He says, I will build my church. And as living stones, he places us in the body of Christ where he wants us. It's his responsibility. We simply need to be available. That's very powerful. Apart from Jesus in John chapter 15, we can't do anything. But if we make ourselves available through faith and let Jesus do the work, that changes it. Jesus says in Matthew, our final scripture, Matthew 11 verse 28, Come to me, the first part is come to me, all you labour and are heavy laden and I will give you. So there's the coming and Jesus I will. So whether it's come to me, follow me and I will make you or come to me and I will give you rest as a responsibility that Jesus takes charge of. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, do you know what a yoke is? When I was in Myanmar recently, I couldn't believe it. I've got some beautiful video of a yoke of oxen, all these oxen pulling a wooden cart, and across their chest is a big timber beam, and, and it's made to suit the oxen, and they just pull this cart. Oh, I was surprised. Here we are in, the, in 19... Sorry, 20... 19, heading to 2020, and there's still people with wooden carts pulled by oxen. I couldn't believe it. We've got petrol. We've had petrol for 100 years. But parts of the world are still like that. Take my yoke upon you, whatever Jesus burden that Jesus has for us, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Do you consider Jesus as gentle and lowly, who gives just right what suits you, and you'll find rest for your souls. So the burden that Jesus gives us suits us so well that it doesn't, it's not the slavery of sin and death and suffering of this world. Then he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The call to discipleship is not hard. What I'm calling you to fits you perfectly according to the gifts that I've given you. So what we are talking about is not onerous, it's not difficult, it's not misfitting. It's perfect for us. And Matthew, that scripture in Matthew ties that up. Our commitment is simply to surrender all and be available. How available are you? How surrendered are we? We must allow Jesus Christ to mould, shape, equip, affirm each of us as he sees fit into the body of Christ. 
And so like the Apostle Paul, we can say individually and collectively, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. The offshoot of this, living this new life in Christ as he moulds and shapes us, is that our lives naturally began to be magnetic. Jesus drew great crowds who followed him. They heard the word, they saw the light, because he saw them as sheep without shepherd. And we are living in a society of extraordinary darkness and brokenness. And Jesus Christ says, you are the light of the world, like our city on a hill. Why? Because simply, we are image bearers of Jesus Christ, and we are his disciples, called to do a work that fits us perfectly. My prayer and our prayer is that as the weeks and months and the years and the decades go by, we may be stronger in Christ, more equipped to discipleship, to be about his work and will. Hello.